Hi, this is James Joke with most web comic reviews and interviews. Today, we're looking at camera shots for the comic artists. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. One of the ruts that a lot of comic artists get into is they tend to start using the same two basic shots for pretty much everything. That is the medium and the close shot. Now, while this isn't necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, the problem is that after a little while, this tends to get visually bland. You know, it's sort of like tapioca pudding. Everybody loves it, don't get me wrong, but too much of it, yeah. The problem is that it's just there's a lot of really great shots out there and they just simply aren't seeing a lot of use. First off, what I'm going to recommend is that if you're serious about your art, definitely take some film classes. All that information, because film has such an established tradition compared to comic books at least, you ta- start seeing a lot of really great shots in the conversations why those shots work. And when you start looking at a lot of the master comic book artists, you tend to start seeing a lot of those tend to, shots tend to be used all over the place. You know, you don't just see the medium close shot, but you also see the long shots, helicopter shots, so on and so forth. So we'll be looking at a lot of those different shots today. We'll also be looking at some other cinematographic effects that may not be a bad idea to include as well. I mean, the key here is you don't want to basically have your comic looking like tapioca pudding. You know what I mean? So have a little bit more fun with your shots. So let's start off with the medium shot because, well, pretty much everybody's familiar with this. Trust me, I've seen way too many comics. I know you're familiar with this one. The medium shot is pretty much the default shot. You know, when you start thinking generic film shot, this is the one. Basically, this is where you show the person from head to toe and you show everybody in the scene from head to toe. And, you know, it's not a bad one. It's great for action shots. It's great for the great photo shoot. If you've got this really cool costume and you want to show it off, hey, this is the shot for you. It shows every detail there. On the other hand, the problem is that this is way too obvious. It's way too overused in... Everybody uses it for pretty much everything. The one thing a lot of people forget is that it can also be used to show background activity. That is, if you have two people in the forefront, you can show stuff happening in the background. So if you want to throw in some interesting Easter eggs during two people talking at a uh, hamburger stand, for example, this is a shot for you. You can get away with some really great running jokes in the background, like two people chasing each other. For that matter, if you're trying to do a chase scene, you can actually have two people at a hamburger stand and then your hero and your villain come through the scene chasing each other. The reaction shot from the two people at the hamburger stand is going to be pretty much priceless. I mean, don't get me wrong. The medium shot's a really great one, but move on already. The close shot is the second most used shot, obviously. The only problem is that Most comic artists tend to limit it to conversational use. You know, you got two people, brick wall, focusing on their heads, we're good to go. Whereas this sees a lot of use in talking head comics. And yeah, I'm not saying this is a bad way to focus in on a conversation. All I'm saying is that you can use the close shot for a lot more. Even during the conversation itself, you can focus in on different details. If you've got two people that are talking and they happen to be making dinner at the same time, You can focus in on the dinner prep. You can focus in on the oven. You can show the food as it's being cooked. You know, you can get away from the just straight two talking heads situation. You can actually focus in on other parts of the room. Just don't overuse that. At that point, you become, you go from sort of bland to way too distracting. And you want to figure out where that sweet spot is between the two. So, you know, limit it appropriately. The other thing you can use a close shot for is by showing specific information. That is, if you're doing, say, a police procedural and you want to go through the various clues, close shot is definitely going to be your friend. If you're trying to show that two people have two different weapons, you're going to want to do a close shot of their weapons at some point in the comic, especially if the details are relatively minuscule. If you're trying to highlight the difference between two particular characters, Again, close shot will help you focus in on the various details of those two characters so you can definitely show that there's some serious differences between the two and compare and contrast why those differences exist 
you know, like if one of them prefers goggles versus sunglasses, there's your shot. Gloves versus, say, no gloves, you know, little details. The other really cool thing is if you're trying to heighten tension and you're doing a superhero comic, well, even if you're not, let's say you're doing a western and you show two characters reach for the guns. Two ways you can handle this is the standard medium shot where you've got the two people and you see the hands going for the waist. Or you can show their actual close shots of the hands on the actual weapons. You know, which of those two do you think is going to be more effective for the tension building? If you're doing more of a superhero comic, you can actually show a character energizing his fist. You know, take a couple of panels out, show the fist glowing. And all of a sudden, you've got a really great tension builder. What's really great is you can also show the tension de-escalating by showing the glow of the fist decreasing. So, you know, if you've got this really cool tension build scene, you've got a medium shot of two characters, you can show one of their, focusing on one of their hands, glowing, 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 something is said, and all of a sudden it starts fading. You know, it's a classic shot. Then, of course, there's also the really fun before and after. Uh, the Cyclops 2 shot is a classic example here. of The Cyclops of the X-Men, one of the classic shots they have of him is Cyclops without eye beam, followed by Cyclops with the eye beam. You know, it's a really great little action shot, and it's usually somewhat effective. Somewhat effective. In fact, it, it become more of one of Cyclops' actual trademarks. The basic idea here is that the close shot is properly used can not only help to give you a little bit more better of a thermometer on what the tension level is and help build that and as well decrease it, but it can also show you specific information that a medium shot couldn't. So you can do more than just focus in on a conversation with it. Right after that, of course, well, let's back up half a step. With film, you also have a specific shot called the insert shot. This is where you actually see some, you get real intense perspective of what somebody's seeing, and it's usually a straight information shot. Yeah, if you're basically looking at somebody's text logs, for example, or you're looking at a typewritten piece of paper or something like that, this is what we call an insert shot. In the old days of cinematography, this would basically be used for showing what was on a typewriter or, you know, some other obvious text. However, with modern era and we have to deal with modern technology well you all of a sudden have this with text and so you actually have a screen full of text the other option of course with the text is to simply have it actually written on the typography on the margin of the, the comic panel it's just there's a lot of really great ways to do it and an insert shot can actually add a lot of information without being too annoying the other classic insert shot from the comics perspective is the, well, the t countdown timer. This is where you take the information that's being provided by the timer and sort of offset it relative to the other panel, so that way you can actually monitor it as the other activity goes on. Again, one of the more classic shots and possibly irritating, but again, you're basically trying to figure out a way to convey information, and that insert shot is actually not a bad way of doing it. Again, you're not necessarily having it as part of the shot, as part of the scene itself. You're just basically doing a little bit of an offset, and that's all that's going to be in that cute little panel. It's almost a caption. Okay, it's a lot bigger than the caption, but you get the idea. It's just something you want to play with a little bit. The other classic shot that you see in comics but you don't see enough of is the long shot. In movies, this is essentially where they establish the scene. You know, they take a few steps back, show everything that's going on, establish the building they're in, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you see this in comics, but you don't really see a whole lot of it. You know, you'll see the big base picture. You'll see the big battle picture. I mean, it's great, and it's one of the few panels that you can actually use for, that take up an entire page. And that's actually pretty awesome about it. You know, you want to sit up start showing off your big battle scene, you start off with a big splash page, and nothing but the antagonists going after each other, and then the next couple of pages, well, they're pretty much going after each other, you know? 
It's great if you're trying to basically show the scope of things and trying to basically show a few details that you wouldn't be able to at medium or close range. Strangely enough, this is also another way you can actually focus in on a conversation, especially if you've got two characters that are very long-winded and they're just going back and forth between each other, you know? It doesn't matter what they're actually doing. They can be walking from each other. They can be walking in the same direction. They can be yelling at each other, whatever. <clears throat> the basic point here is that the two characters are having a really long conversation. The easiest way to do that is to go extreme long view on them, shrink them down to where they're pretty much just taking small parts of the scene, and just have fun with the conversation. The fun part about this is that this is a nice contrast to the close shot because with a close shot you're showing intimate conversation, whereas with more of a long range you're showing a conversation everybody's listening on. So if you've got two people that are definitely yelling at each other, hey, the long shot is definitely going to be your friend here. Alright, so real quick, the three shots we've got are the close, the medium, and the long. If you're trying to show nice and intimate, close shot's your friend. If you're trying to focus in on a quick conversation, again, close shot's going to be your friend. If you're trying to basically convey the most possible information, generally speaking, you're looking at the medium shot. If you're trying to basically do two battles between two characters, definitely the medium shot. On the other hand, if you're trying to be ultra dramatic and have some fun with it and convey a whole lot of information in a very short period, you're definitely going to be going for the long shot. So, but, that's just the beginning. Yes, there's more. Alright, something to keep in mind is the various shots we've been looking at have been pretty much straight on. That is, if you were to basically gear up a camera, the camera would basically be parallel to the ground, and, and obviously you'd be looking at the characters that way. You can have a lot more fun by changing where the camera is relative to the ground. The helicopter shot is pretty much the obvious one here. This is where you basically take that shot and you go 90 degrees above where the action is. That is, you're looking straight down on things. This isn't really used a whole lot because, well, let's get real. Seeing the tops of characters' heads is pretty much a boring shot. But if you're trying to establish where everything is and you're basically trying to set up some sort of map, hey, Helicopter shot is definitely going to be your friend. It's useful for showing huge battle formations and doing it quickly. That is, if I were looking at, say, the long shot, the major problem is that I'd have to basically be using depth of field in order to show where everybody is. On the other hand, if I shift over to a helicopter shot, I can show a visual representation where everybody is and I know exactly where everybody's looking. You know, I don't have to guess. If I've got two really tall characters, I have to put them in the back of a long shot. I don't have to when it's a helicopter shot. You know, there's two really huge characters. Yeah, if they're not in the back of the shot, well, they're going to pretty much be crowding everybody else out, you know? The other problem with the straight long shot when it comes to showing a battle formation is that you don't really get to see a lot of the details. I mean, sure, you get to see where all the conflicts are going. You get to see people lining up against each other. But you don't actually get to see, you know, what kind of covers they're using, that sort of thing. With a helicopter shot, you get a much better feel for what's going on. It's not as dramatic, and it can actually be a little bit boring. But sometimes you want that boring, you know? You want to establish where everybody is in the scene, and then you actually want to start going for it. This is also really great if you're trying to do a murder mystery and you're trying to show, again, where everybody pretty much is. It's just, there's a lot of really great ways you can use the helicopter shot as a graphical representation as well. You don't have to do the standard, you know, top of the heads and surrounding area. You can actually convert this down to a graphic symbols and have fun with it from there. And that sense of personal emergency or you know, personal urgency, sorry, is another really great reason to use a helicopter shot versus a long shot. That is, with a long shot, you're focusing in on all the drama and all the tension, which is really great, don't get me wrong, if you're going for that thing, but if you're trying to show that this is more of a cold, analytical battle, well, all of a sudden, the helicopter shot is a much better because it's got a more clinical view. That is, it's a more 
analytical versus the more emotional view. So if you've got two teams that are going up against each other and you're trying to make it a point that they basically have no choice and it's just a matter of, well, business for the two teams, hey, the helicopter sh- shot to show where everybody is and where the battle is going at it from there, it's definitely going to be the way to go. On the other hand, if you're trying to show two teams that have been in crisis for a long time and all of a sudden it's coming to a boil and they're just going at each other, long shot again is going to be your friend in that area. So, helicopter shot is a little bit more clinical, a little more analytical than the emotional, personal long shot, if it helps. However, you don't have to take the shot to a great 90 degree. Keep in mind that one of the more fun shots is from, well, going from down low. I mean, let's get real. Everybody likes the east campfire shot, you know? This is the, where you've got the light coming from below. You've got the camera's been set, so it's looking up at the person, making them look a little bit more imposing. And you're having a lot of fun just basically making this guy look really tough and buff and all sorts of scary. Obviously, this is where your down low shot's going to come in handy. It can also be shown, used to show a lot of perspective. You know, if you've got a juror, or more, sorry, if you've got a court scene and you're trying to demonstrate just how powerful the judge is, yeah, you can show him from low. Great way to do it. On the flip side, if you're trying to show somebody's more diminished, that is, they're shy, they're reserved, or they've been cowed, you know, if that person's been broken and you're trying to show this pretty obviously. Yeah, then you just basically go from above. At that point, the person looks smaller, more reserved, and basically looks like they're scared and timid. You know, I don't care if you're Superman and you're about ready to take on Lex Luthor. You show him from up high, all of a sudden he's going to be looking like he has something to be scared of. If you want to, you can look at the, says, the David shot. In this case, the joke here is that uh, Leonardo da Vinci's David statue, if you look at it from above, actually looks like the guy's terrified. So, just something to consider is where the camera's positioned relative to everybody. Another neat camera trick is if you have kids in the scene, a lot of problems a lot of people do, they do a medium shot, but they do it from the regular, you know, putting the camera at the regular three to four foot height. Well, if you got a kid and you're trying to show just how small that kid is, take that normal three to four foot height and drop it down to about two to three feet. Yeah, you're going to be chopping off a lot of people's heads. You're going to, heck, you might even be chopping a lot of their arms off. And you're definitely going to be focusing on their feet and legs. But if you're trying to show a kid's perspective and or even a smaller character's perspective, like a dog or a midget or anything like that, then yeah. You're going to be wanting to drop that down to more of a low shot and have a lot of fun with it. I mean, if you're trying to show off this really great piece of technology and it's not full-size human, or even if you've got, say, a couple of dogs and you're trying to show everything from their perspective, hey, the down low shot is definitely going to be one you're going to be looking at. It's a great classic shot. It gets a lot of information across, and it basically shows a little bit more infinite innocence and wonder as far as what's going on. After all, at that point, the conversation seemed like they're coming on high rather than just regular. So anybody around them is going to be taking on a little bit more awe and wonder. And I want you to think about that when you've got a regular person with a couple of superheroes. I mean, think about this for a second. Who's who DC's directory to their heroes? Well, somebody actually went through and actually tracked down just the average heights of the villains and the heroes and it came out that Generally speaking, the average height of a hero is about five foot ten. Conversely, your average person is about five foot six, five foot seven. Now that may not seem like a whole bunch of difference, but when you're trying to portray this visually and you exaggerate just a little bit, all of a sudden the heroes in your book all of a sudden become a little bit more tougher and a lot more powerful. Especially if you can show the full size human from I don't know, from waist to top of his head, and all you're doing is showing the heroes all the way up to their ears. You know, you're chopping off the tops of their heads, or for that matter, you're chopping off their heads completely to emphasize that height difference. All of a sudden, your heroes become a lot more imposing, a lot more intimidating. They become just more statuesque than 
well, the regular person they're talking with. Yeah, I know it's an exaggeration, but again, think about that for a second. Most of your DC heroes are about five, I average out to about five foot ten. And yeah, I know it's only a couple inches above regular human, but it's just sort of interesting what you can exaggerate that and use it for effect, you know? And again, using a variation of the down low, where instead of basically, like I said, like putting the camera at the average distance it is and just shrinking it down a little bit, can actually increase some emotional effects for you. It can make your characters look a bit more intimidated. On the other hand, the character you're focusing in on is going to be seeming to be a little bit more naive and a little bit more dependent on other people. Again, the down low is basically used for kids' shots. Because of that, when we see it in the comics, it's going to be in, come across as whoever it's focusing in on, whoever that effect is coming from, is going to be seen as, well, the kid in the picture. So use that for whatever effect you want. Going back to the insert shot for a second, keep in mind there are different ways of doing insert shots that come across really well. You can actually shift it to instead of being a straight, this is what everybody sees type of deal, to whatever a computer sees. This means that you can do those really cool color schemes and false color images or, you know, heat vision or anything like that. All of a sudden, those insert shots become, go from being straight information to actually showing off what the people can do. If you've got a couple of robots in the area and you're trying to demonstrate that they're highlighting information, like the Terminator, again, insert shot is the way to go. Except this in, case, in this case, instead of a regular what everybody sees type of shot, you're seeing it through the lens of that particular computer or that particular robot. And you're actually seeing how they portray information to each other. Which can be really weird, especially if you've got some sort of matrix effects going on. And keep in mind, you don't have to do this as an offset panel like you would with a countdown clock or anything like that. Uh, Spawn is a pretty good example here, because every time they showed Al Simmons' power draining, because of his power use, they'd actually show the clock, or something resembling a clock, would basically take up its own little panel. You know, you'd have the action panel that would stretch across the screen, what was nothing but the countdown clock, and then resume the regular comic. You can do that as well for your own uses. Um, the other uses for the insert shot is if you have some sort of score going on or if you have some sort of information you need to keep track of and actually relay over to the characters, or sorry, relay over to the readers that the characters may not have information to. You know? If you're trying to do a sports game, for example, having an ongoing game board and just putting that as an insert shot every so often, showing where the score is and how much time is remaining... Well, at that point, you're not only giving information as far as the score goes, but by use of that countdown clock that's actually part of that game display, you're also helping to build attention a little bit. So the insert shot, especially if you use it as a graphic information source, it's definitely going to be your best friend. But again, don't get too crazy with it. Otherwise, you're going to basically create a distraction more than anything else. One of the shots that doesn't work too well in film but would look great in comics is an over-the-shoulder shot. What this does is it allows you to show the character's perspective without losing any information. So if you're trying to show that the character is trying to blow up something or is trying to, you know, some sort of duel, and you're trying to show basically one character's identity, i.e. the victim's, without showing the shooter's identity, well, the over-the-shoulder shot is pretty much a classic. Yeah, you tend to see this one used to, to such a degree that it's more, sort of a cliche. But, again, it's another way of portraying information, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Just don't get too crazy with it. You can also basically show it, you know, if you want, don't want to do a full insert shot. You just want to show, but you do want to show what a character is reading or texting. And over-the-shoulder shots pretty well. If you're trying to help have two characters with a conversation, well... In cinematography, we call this the rule of 180. It's all of a sudden going to come to effect. That is, you show the conversation. As a person is speaking, you see that person from over the shoulder of the other person. So if character A says something, 
you're looking at it from character B's shoulder. And then, of course, you'll switch that around with the, when character B is speaking. That's a pretty much basic rule of 180. It's a really great way of getting away from the close shots for the conversation, and it allows you to have a little bit more fun. You know, if you've got two characters that are having a little bit of repartee while they're eating or drawing or doing something, you can actually show that little bit of action while at the same time they're holding the conversation. Of course, if you can also do this in a gunfight, you know, again, you've got an action, you've got a conversation. The over-the-shoulder shot's a great way of combining the action and the conversation. And you don't lose any real information. In fact, you actually increase it a little bit because at that point you have no idea what the other person is really doing. You're going to have to infer and hope your inference is right and then be proven right or wrong by the next time you see the person, which is sort of a weird way of looking at it. But just go with me on this, okay? The bottom line is that the over-shoulder shot can actually be really great when it comes to, you know, just you having a little bit of fun with things. So if you get really bored of the medium shot where you basically have two people shooting it out with each other, hey, just go into conversation mode with it, so to speak. And you're going to see that attention is going to be up just a little bit. Something you might, I know we've touched on this a little bit before back in the close shot, but let's have a little bit more fun with the concept of two characters talking off stage. The basic idea here is you've got people holding a conversation that, well, one or both of them isn't actually present in the actual scene itself. That is, let's look at a police interrogation. And we're talking the classic, you know, you're focusing on the person, you've got the interrogator off screen. At that point, the interrogator is going to be looking a lot more intimidating because you don't actually see them. You're focusing in on the psychology of the person that they're actually being interrogated. So if you're trying to show that the person is nervous, fidgety, is just simply doesn't want to be there, this is a great way of doing it. You know, you take one of the characters off stage and you focus solely on that particular character. This can also show a character who basically doesn't really, you know, who's ultra stoic, who isn't faced by anything, and all of a sudden he's put into a situation most people would find intimidating, and he's like, so? And you can actually show this person. You know, three or four scenes of this person doing exactly the same in exactly the same pose is going to get across a lot more information than a character who's just doing a little bit minor fidgety stuff. You know, sometimes you do want to show that the same characters, you don't want to mess with the character's pose, which is sort of a weird way of looking at it because you're trying to actually show action in these things, right? Yeah, this is a time when you don't want to show action. You're showing no action is actually going to be stronger than if you showed action. So, go for it. Have some fun with it. You don't have to have all of your characters be hyperkinetic speed demons. Sometimes it can be fun to show a character who's pretty much made out of ice. Sometimes literally. Or made out of rock. Again, sometimes literally. But, you're trying to have a little bit of fun with what you're showing. And all of a sudden... You, you know, having one or two characters off screen. Another way, another advantage to having characters off screen is that basically you can actually concentrate on the details of the situation. So if you've got them going over a murder scene, you can actually focus in on the clues is while well, the characters have all this information going on, you know. Even if it's just a basic banal conversation, you know. Uh, how's the wife? She's fine. Did you get the tickets? You know, real boring conversation you can actually have that keyed into whatever's going on in the scene. So, you know, you've got this murder investigation, you want to focus in on the clues. The same as if you've got two characters trying to do research on each other. I mean, Batman is infamous for doing these research scenes that are incredibly boring and not always totally exciting. But, he does them anyway. And one of the best ways to do it is to have him and Alfred having some sort of conversation or even Batman talking to himself, because let's get it real. The guy has no social life. He's going to be talking to someone. And nine times out of ten, Alfred isn't going to be available. Heck, I think that's one of the reasons he has Robins. Just to have somebody to talk to. Poor guy. But the key here is that when you start doing some of these scenes, you're going to want to have them with the characters 
off screen but still hear the dialogue and hear the thought process. This just happens to be one way of doing it. And if one character happens to be off screen and you're just simply showing the reaction shots to whatever he's saying, well, all of a sudden that character becomes a little bit more intimidating, a little bit more mysterious. So try to, try to see how putting one or two characters off screen works for you and have a little bit more fun with it. The other technique and one that tends to be looked down for, especially in an era of, you know, show, don't tell, is, of course, the dreaded voiceover. The problem is, is that a lot of people don't like seeing characters in their monologue. They don't really care what a character is thinking. They want to just want to see what the character does. Well, the narrative, the voiceover, uh, basically takes a step back and actually starts showing what the character is actually thinking. Even though this will be shown mostly through captions and such, the basic concept here is that you're having a character actually doing and showing what that person is actually thinking. The best example is, well, the Blade Runner movie, where you actually start hearing what Deckard's thinking and his thoughts on various subjects throughout the movie. This adds a little bit to it, and yeah, it gives it a little bit of a noirish feel, which in some cases can actually work for your, to your advantage. Um, the only thing to keep in mind here is you don't want to overuse it. One of the problems with voiceover narration is that it just simply gets really aggravating, especially when you've got this person talking pretty much all over the place and he's just throwing in information that really doesn't fit the situation. So when you start doing your voiceover narration, make sure that it's actually being used to effect and it's not just being used. Otherwise, you go from going having some sort of noirish thing to this person has some serious psychological issues that you just can't shut up. So give the character a chance to, well, not to hear from him for a little while. Sometimes you want other characters to talk instead. But it can be used effectively, especially if you've got some sort of detective situation where you want to hear that train of thought or where you want to hear a little bit of character background and you don't want to get too crazy with it. By the way, the best way to do this in a comic is to make sure that each character has a color associated with that particular person, so that way when they start doing the voiceover narration, you know basically who's talking. You don't really have to think about it too much. Otherwise, you're going to have to use the dreaded character name narration type format, and that can get aggravating. Readers don't like that, and if we can just go with a straight, this character is red, his thoughts are red, we're cool. This character is blue, his thoughts are blue, Great. You know, a simple, nice little visual shorthand. And guess what? You're in a visual medium. So, hey, this works for you. All right, there's two areas where comic books actually go better than movies. I mean, there's still cinema, cinematographic techniques, but the comic book variation is a little bit stronger. Specifically, flashbacks, sorry, flashbacks and point-of-view shots. What I'm basically looking at here is, first off, with the flashback, one of the cool things that a comic book does, or at least used to, was that the ink of the, basically the entire coloration of the panels would change for the purposes of a flashback. That is, they take on a sepia tone, you know, a little bit browner, a little bit tanner, versus, say, a movie which would make, do a little bit of a saturation tone. The advantage of a flashback is it allows you to go through some information and actually have a little bit of fun with it. You know, you're trying to show the origin of the character and you don't want to break from wherever they currently are. You can go into a flashback mode and just simply, this is what I remember and have a little bit of fun with that. And more importantly, you're showing you're not telling what that memory is. You've just decided to co change the coloration of the panels in order to be better shift it, you know, show the shift from present to past. Of course, the fun part is, is that you can also show present to future. And yeah, this can get sort of aggravating and you might want to establish some sort of different coloration for future events. But if you're trying to basically have a psychic character, showing future events isn't necessarily a bad thing. And the cool thing is that because you've got control over the panels, you can actually have different panels that you're actually going to be using in the future can actually shift them back into the past thing and colors them a little bit differently. And hey, you've got 
double the use out of the same panels, which is sort of cool. Yeah, I know I've got psyche characters all of a sudden they've become really popular among lazy artists. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. All I'm saying is that you can actually use different colors of ink in order to show different t time spans that aren't necessarily representing the time that you're currently dealing with. You know, you're trying to describe past events, you're trying to describe future events, and you're trying to put it into the same time you're dealing with the present. Yeah, I know it's a minor headache, and that's probably why it's not flashbacks and psychic flashes aren't used all that often. But if you're trying to do something a little bit different, you want a little bit another storytelling technique, looking at how to do flashbacks and psychic impressions isn't necessarily a bad thing to look at. And in this case, when, by the way, when I'm looking at point of view in, in this instance, I'm not necessarily looking at it from a point of view from a character, but from a point of view from an impartial observer. I guess it'd be more of a panning technique. You know, where you're basically showing information on one thing, seeing a couple of panels to switch over to another person, and you're actually showing via frames what actually is going the actual movement of the camera. So if you've got two characters, let's say you've got in a movie where you're trying to fo change focus from one character to another, or from one s what one's doing to what another character is doing. Well, what would happen sometimes is that you do a really quick freeze frame, and then you take up the action where you've actually shifted the characters. Well, with panning technique, you can do pretty much the exact same thing. You know, you've got something going on with one character, show a couple of empty frames that show the camera actually traveling to the next person, and then take up the action on the next panel right there. Yeah, it can get a little aggravating, but it's having a little bit more fun with it. It's not just simply showing the same old, same old, you know, instant cut from one scene to the other one. You're having a little bit of fun with it and showing stuff going on in the space background in the meantime. So if you're trying to show just how big that fight is, show character A and B going at it, show a frame of other characters fighting, another frame of other characters fighting, and then go on to characters C and D you are also slugging it out. And keep in mind, this is not necessarily slugging it out in terms of physical combat, but it can be a, a shouting match. This can get all sorts of interesting in and of itself. And obviously, this is a technique you're not going to want to use too often, but when you do use it, it's going to allow you to show some of the stuff going on in the background and get clips of other fights that are going on just to show you that this is happening within some sort of continuity rather than pretty much all by its lonesome. Because that becomes a little bit more awesome, you know what I mean? There's one other technique that's worth talking about, but it's more of a, in a don't-do-it type of sense, and that's the dreaded zoom out, zoom in, scene transition technique. This is basically where you take, start off with one panel and you're trying to transition to another scene. So what you do is you take one of the panels, the last panel basically from the one scene and basically replace it with smaller versions of itself and then take a panel from the next scene and start increasing the size of those. The problem with this is that while occasionally it can work, it only works when you start when you have some sort of context will make it work in that is if I'm dealing with spies and I'm dealing with satellite cameras as in cameras that are actually mounted on actual satellites that are actually looking down then that technique can actually work normally however it just comes off as sort of forced I mean so it basically is a really cool stylistic way of doing a scene change but you have to keep in mind that if you're not using it right and you have no actual context for it, it's going to come off as more artistic than anything else. And you don't want shots to simply be artistic. You actually want every panel you have to have some sort of information to it. And all you're doing is literally copying the same information but shrinking it down or increasing the size. Yeah, readers don't really like that too much. But like I said, if you've got a situation where you're trying to transfer from two scenes and you've established that you've got some sort of satellite overwatch or some other equivalent this can actually work out well for you if nothing else it can actually be just a nice little variant on a straight scene change every so often another way to transition from scene to scene is similarities and you know this one you i mean it tends to get overused in some really bad cinema but also seems to 
come into a lot of really great cinema as well. So this is essentially where you take two objects, they're roughly the same in both scenes, and you basically use that as your transitioning point. So for example, if I'm trying to transition from a pizza joint, I tra look at one of the pizzas and you know, big, huge circle, and then I'd be transferring over to, say, somewhere in Florida, and I'd be transferring, and I'd be, next thing we'd basically be having an orange in the exact same place that the pizza was. You know, you're using a similar object in order to affect the transition from one scene to another and trying to be nice and easy about it. You can also use lines of dialogue to accomplish the same thing, especially if the two dialogues are entirely different motivation. So, you know, you can go from a, he said what, in one scene, and a, he said what, in the other scene, and it comes off as really effective. You can actually use that piece of dialogue as your scene transitioning tool. So, just a little thing to consider. What's really great about these, these two tools, by this using something similar to affect a transition, is it actually helps you develop character between the two different scenes. So, if you've got two characters that you're trying to establish that they have some similarities but some major differences, you know, these can actually be used effectively. Especially if you have like the diff use the diff the similarities to transfer the scene and then highlight the differences between them in the actuality. So it's sort of a nice little tool. You don't get too crazy with the similarity transition technique. The problem is that a lot of things you see in the superhero comics is that you have two characters that are shooting a ray, and they use that ray to basically use go from one scene to another. The problem, of course, is that it creates a little bit of visual confusion. So, you know, they're either basically fighting each other and they're entirely two different areas, and they have nothing to do with each other, or they're f apparently firing on the same person. You know, it's, sometimes that works, but nine times out of ten... It really doesn't. It just creates a certain level of visual confusion. So you can use what people are saying. You can use items within the scene. Just try to avoid using similar actions to, yeah, as a transition techni technique. Overall, the point here is that you need to get away from close and medium shots. There's a lot of really great shots out there. There's a lot of really great techniques out there. And it's just a matter of watching movies and actually applying these two years comics. I mean, this thing else, watch the movies. I mean, just look, at, just look at how many of them tend to use the same shot over and over and over, and it's pretty much boring, you know? They might have a few establishing shots, they might have a few close-up shots, but 90% 90 90 of the movie is pretty much nothing but medium shots. You know, how boring would that be? And you need to apply that to your comic as well. Just have a little bit more fun of it. Take a few basic introductions to film classes and have some fun with it. You know, you've got to get out of the just close and medium type things. That, you need to encourage your writer to use these techniques as well because each one of these techniques can also be used as different visual representation and that can actually add into the quality of the actual writing itself. You know, it goes from just simply the writer thinking in terms of just simply this is what's going on to is there a way to symbolically represent this that's a lot more effective than a straight, you know, straight medium or close shot? And nine times out of ten, that's a net question that's going to have a fun answer to it. Now, you and the writer can work together and establish this and get beyond the mere Marvel method. You know, where basically you're coming up with, you're drawing stuff and then it's getting dialogued after. The cinemagraphic stuff, you can actually have a lot of fun between the two of you. You know, especially if he has a little bit of film school behind him and you're just learning how to do basic art. For that matter, if you think you're an advanced student of the art and you're not applying a lot of these really cool shots, yeah, you basically have some stuff you need to learn. The two of you, like I said, writer and illustrator need to work together in order to create a comic. If you can figure out a little ways to have a little bit more fun with the shots, you're going to find your comics are going to be a lot higher quality than they were previous. More importantly, they're going to be a lot more visually interesting. And you're going to get away from the usual visual tapioca. And trust me, there's nothing better than tapioca, but it can get a little bit boring after a while, you know what I mean? So please, 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 please 
try to get away from the medium and close shots as much as possible. Don't get too obnoxious with it, but have a little bit of fun with it. So, that said, if this information has been useful to you and you want to see some more tips and tricks in that area, please check me out on my Patreon page at patreon.com slash two sparrows, T-W-O. There's always going to be some weird stuff there, and once in a while I'll throw some really interesting stuff there. Like unedited interviews. Maybe uh, even an advanced copy of a podcast coming up. That sort of thing. So please check it out the pod at patreon.com slash two sparrows and uh please subscribe thank you and have a great day i'll talk to you later